Thank you and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us to discuss um, this uh, uh, auspicious uh, day, the report that uh, uh, Michael Marmot and his team at the Institute for Health Equity have been working on with us in Greater Manchester over the last couple of years. Build Back Fair in Greater Manchester. So um, we hope that you'll uh, find the session useful um, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to um, post questions, um, which we hope you will to be able to answer afterwards. But um, we're really, really pleased that um, uh, we've got Sir Michael with us today, but also Andy Burnham, our mayor. But first of all, just to give you um, a, a hint about how to post your questions, um, Michelle, could you just brief everybody? Thank you. We have a Mentimeter open uh, so you can grab your phone or open a web browser. It's www.menti.com and the code is 15257698. All questions will be collated and shared post session once we've got some responses to the questions. Thank you, Michelle. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Sir Michael Marmot to, to introduce the report um, that we're launching today. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Um, th this report happened because uh, of colleagues in Greater Manchester and we're absolutely delighted to be able to do this with you. Am I controlling this? You should have access now. Um, you'll, oh, there we go. There's a mantra of build back better. We wanted to change that to build back fairer. We emphasize it's moral. Social justice is a moral imperative, but the report gives practical ways to thinking about leveling up and we say put equity of health and well-being at the heart of all policy. Can you move it along? I could, there we go. Um, and we think the opportunity is now. When we produced Fair Society Healthy Lives in 2010, Coventry declared itself a Marmot city. We've been approached from all around the country, uh, local governments, legal in general, big insurance, financial sector company approached us to, to help other businesses and voluntary sectors. So the question is, why Greater Manchester? Well, I think that GM, can you move it along? I'm clicking and pressing like nobody's business. Um, GM is exciting for us because I think the first thing is you wanted us. And that's very important because we're not coming into you saying do this. You came to us and said, let's work together. And I've been saying this all morning. I have been inspired by Greater Manchester's vision for the future, um, that you don't have your heads down depressed at government cuts. You're saying, how can we create Manchester as the best place for children to flourish? The leadership has come from the mayor and the leaders of the various sectors, but all the sectors are involved, including the community. So we have a Build Back Fairer framework. The domains, I'll come back to it, uh, that are important, and then the mechanisms that are needed to build back fairer. Next. The issue of why GM should be suffering so badly has to go back to where Greater Manchester was before the pandemic. If we look at the English average for life expectancy, then Trafford uh, for male, Trafford and Stockport, Stockport were longer than the English average, but every other local authority within Greater Manchester uh, and the Northwest and GM as a whole had shorter life expectancy than the English average. And if we look at the female average for England, Trafford and Stockport longer than the average for England, but the Northwest and GM and every other local authority within GM shorter than the average for England. That's where we were pre-pandemic. Next, please. 
And as we reported, the COVID-19 mortality was 25% higher in GM than in England as a whole. So this is GM mortality, the male English average. And every one of these areas within Greater Manchester and Greater Manchester and the Northwest as a whole had higher mortality than the English average from COVID-19. And for females, once again, all higher except Stockport, 25% higher on average. Next, please. And this is catastrophic. In a loose phrase yesterday to the press, I said it was jaw dropping. I might have found a more eloquent way to describe it, but it is jaw dropping. Life expectancy in 2020 dropped by 1.2 years for women and 1.6 years for men and dropped in the country as a whole. But that really is astonishing that we get such a drop in life expectancy in one year. A disaster. Next, please. And of course, COVID-19 mortality follows the social gradient. Degrees of deprivation, most deprived, least deprived. For the top two deciles, the least deprived in Greater Manchester, mortality from COVID-19 was less than the England average, not the England average for the least deprived, the English average, but for every other decile of deprivation, it was higher than the English average, and it's a social gradient that looks very like the social gradient for all courses. Next slide. Child poverty in Greater Manchester after housing costs is astonishingly high. We reported in our Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on, 30% child poverty in England. And in each of these local authorities within Greater Manchester, astonishingly high levels of child poverty, up to 40% in Oldham and higher in Manchester. Next slide, please. Classroom learning, days of classroom learning missed per student. So this is the effect now of lockdown. State funded primary, state funded secondary, and the England average. So the educational divide is getting worse because of lockdown. Next, please. Parents' level of concern about children's mental health in Greater Manchester. Somewhat concern? Wow, more than 70% by February 2021. Big concern, more than 30% of parents have a big concern about their children's mental health and a staggering increase. Next, please. Proportion of employees that were low paid in Greater Manchester, that means less than two thirds of the median or less than the living wage or at the minimum wage. Goodness, astonishingly high levels. And again, this is all preceding the pandemic and only gets worse during the pandemic. Next, please. The percentage of people financially impact by the, impacted by the pandemic, workload reduced hours, lost their job, been made redundant, got support from a, a local community hub, needed to use a food bank. This is the different periods. Next, please. And the reduction in public health spending. Public health, of course, or the health of the public is about much more than organized public health. It's about all the things we talk about, early childhood, education, housing, jobs, money, communities, transport. But organized public health is of vital importance and public health spending in real terms um, went down dramatically 2014 to 2021. Um, and in the Northwest, the reduction in organized public health expenditure was greater than the reduction in England as a whole. Next, please. So this is our framework. And I'll show you what's in it. Next, please. 
So build back fairer for future generations, prioritize children, young people, build back fair resources. And when we say that this is a blueprint for the government for leveling up, they do have to put money into it. There's a great deal the great Greater Manchester can do on its own with devolution and with the commitment of, of wonderful public servants right across Greater Manchester, but it does need resources, standards, institutions, monitoring and accountability, and greater local power and control. Next slide, please. And we've developed 24 with colleagues in GM, 24 Marmot Beacon Indicators to monitor. We don't have to wait to see if health and equality's got less. We can monitor progress on these indicators. Next, please. And what we've done, we hope, is to lay a blueprint for GM and for the country as a whole as to how to build back fairer. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Really helpful to have um, uh, uh, the key points from the report highlighted for us and, and how shocking they all are. But I suppose taking that point that, um, you know, we're building on a really good foundation in Greater Manchester in terms of the way that we work. But can I hand over now to um, Andy Burnham, the Mayor for Greater Manchester, to give his thoughts and response to the report? Thanks, Andy. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah <clears throat> and uh, Michael. On behalf of everybody in Greater Manchester, I just want to say we owe you and your team at the Institute of Health Equity at UCL a huge debt of thanks uh, because you have um, really uh, just taken us through uh, in detail what has been going on here over the last 18 months so that there is a clear understanding of how much uh, people have gone through and what we now need uh, to support individual and collective recovery uh, over the over the coming weeks and months. Your and my journey together began in February 2010 when you delivered um, the uh, report on health inequalities to me as health secretary and uh, we've been on a journey since then haven't we in February 2020 um, we <clears throat> were together at your 10-year update where you said that life ex expectancy had stalled uh, following a decade of austerity and cuts that has hit obviously parts of the north very hard, hard indeed. So we were not in a position at all really were we to face uh, a pandemic um, and uh, the figures that you've taken us through and particularly the, um, the death rate here sadly from Covid um, is a reflection uh, of, of that. But let's look at this more positively. This could be, couldn't it, a moment for change. The power of what you've just said is clear and I want people in all levels of government, also national government, to feel the power of your words. We will be enthusiastic members of the, the Build Back Fairer movement because that is what this country must now do. COVID-19 has brutally exposed just how unequal England is and we know now, thanks to you and your team, the things, the interventions that will make a real difference that will build health in in our homes in our communities build resilience uh, and it just now needs to be done uh, and it needs to be backed um, at a national a national level obviously <clears throat> for us in commissioning you and your team to do this work it's challenging it's challenging for greater manchester to see the the headlines that are uh, around uh, today but i'm proud that we have been able to do it and and take this this look at our look at ourselves but as you just said, uh, Michael, I am surrounded by brilliant public servants uh, in Greater Manchester, brilliant leaders of our councils. And actually, if anywhere can do it, I feel we can because of the determination people have here to improve the lives of our residents and to improve their health. And I can say that to you, there will be no lack of passion here in terms of trying to turn what you've told us uh, into, into a meaningful response. Uh, to the pandemic. This, just to be clear about what you're saying, <clears throat> it's it's a, a fact that we've been hit harder because our residents have been more exposed to COVID. More of our residents have been more exposed than perhaps other parts of the country. So 
Why is that? We've had more residents who never been able to stay at home because of the nature of their job. So they've worked all the way through and more people here have been in that position than elsewhere. And more people here work in those professions that have been at higher risk uh, during the pandemic. So in retail or transport or in social care or security, that is also uh, a factor of the Greater Manchester uh, uh, economy and society. Sadly, taking it another level, many of the people in those professions are not employed in a way that allows them to take time off work if they are ill. They simply won't be paid. And they will not be able um, to access sick pay because of the insecure uh, nature of their of their employment. And then to, to take it even further, obviously they often don't have housing arrangements where if they have been exposed at work, where they are able to protect their family uh, from what they may have been exposed to uh, at work. And, and that is the, the reality of the situation. And it explains why we have struggled with a higher case rate uh, all the way, all the way uh, through. Um, and I just want to now sort of turn this into well, what do we do about uh, what do we do about all of that? I think there are things for government here, and I want to make a point particularly about the pandemic response not having been sufficiently attuned to the health inequalities of our country. I think you've made the point, Michael, that lockdown, particularly the first lockdown, was not lifted with an eye to the areas where the case rates were highest. I think it was lifted with an eye more to London and the south uh, of the country. And that created a real problem uh, for us throughout uh, 2020. And you make that point. <clears throat> but there, there have been other ways in which the pandemic response nationally has not taken sufficient regard of the health inequalities that we have across England. So, for instance, the vaccination programme has proceeded at a sort of all areas at the same pace, whereas we have argued all the way through that there should be greater uh, supplies surged into areas where the cases are highest and the inequalities uh, greatest. And that is a point I think that needs to be continue, uh, to, to be made as we approach the booster programme in the autumn. It, it must be the case that we uh, target more supplies on the areas that are more at risk. But also another point that hasn't been addressed properly is the whole question of self-isolation. Because of the insecure nature of many of our residents' employment, we needed a self-isolation uh, support arrangement that would allow people to go off work if they were ill or to self-isolate if they were asked to do so. And we, we have never got that issue right. And that still is a problem and it still is something that can be that can be fixed. As you say, though, turning more broadly, Michael, to the kind of fundamentals of the report, this is in the end about levelling up. And I would say to the government, it is time now to get much more serious about this task of levelling up. And it really is an endeavour that should start in the communities that have been hardest hit by COVID. And levelling up can't fix those communities with promises of infrastructure into the distant future. It has got to be about people's lives, people's homes, people's jobs, people's communities and improving all of those things. Health is not built in hospitals. Health is built in homes, in workplaces, in, in the streets where people uh, live. Or, or it's not. It's either damaged in those places. And sadly, we have a society at the moment where people's physical and mental health is damaged by their work, the insecurity uh, of their work. People's physical and mental health is damaged by their housing uh, situation. It's far too many people living in homes that don't meet the decent homes uh, standard, particularly in the private rented uh, sector. And because people don't have security over their uh, over their pay, they therefore don't have security over their home. And it's why so many people, not just in Greater Manchester, across the country, are living on the edge. And that's why I, I think following the COVID pandemic, there's another pandemic looming, which is a mental health uh, pandemic. If we don't uh, build back fairer and change uh, things for the better. So levelling up has got to be about people in the areas hit hardest, improving people's homes, improving people's jobs. Uh, and I say that to the government in, in all sincerity. Work with us on that. You know, truly level up this country and go to the heart of the challenge uh, that, that we've all got before us that has been laid bare 
by this COVID uh, pandemic. I'll finish, uh, Sarah, just on what we though can do for ourselves, because this isn't about Greater Manchester just making a, a pitch for more power or resources, although we're grateful for Michael's uh, support uh, on that. There is more we can do uh, for ourselves on those um, six core recommendations that you've uh, that you've made. You, you made the point about younger people and giving our teenagers a sense of hope, a sense of ambition. I'm, I'm very proud that tomorrow we will open for applications um, the R Pass, our free bus pass for 16 to 18 year olds. And this will be extended to the year 11s going into year 12, a group of young people who've been hit really hard uh, by this uh, pandemic. We will, Michael, look to implement in full the young person's guarantee. So linking the free travel to more opportunities uh, for people now to, to get on uh, post uh, pandemic. But more broadly, we will look at linking the Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter to public procurement uh, in our city region so that we do what we can to improve people's jobs, jobs that pay a real living wage, that have um, security uh, and, and flexibility uh, as part of them. We will now be bringing forward a good landlord charter, so we improve homes in the private rented uh, sector. And we are more broadly um, thinking about our recovery. It is time to put rising to the climate crisis at the heart of, of things so that we we improve the environment that people live in. I'm proud to say to you, Michael, that myself and the 10 leaders of Greater Manchester last week endorsed the UK's largest clean air zone, which will cover all 10 boroughs of Greater Manchester and will remove the illegal con uh, contaminants from the air in our communities, because the reality of the matter is it's the poorest kids in the poorest communities that breathe in the most polluted air uh, from, from road traffic. And we are going to do something about that. And by changing the way transport works through that, we will also look to build the London style public transport system that we've long aspired to with, I hope, London level fares so that our residents can connect to jobs and opportunity right across the city region. The point I'm making is by rising to the climate crisis, we can also rise to solve the jobs crisis and the housing crisis. If we retrofit people's homes to make them zero carbon, we can create thousands of good jobs uh, for our young people and improve people's homes in the process so that we therefore improve their health uh, going forward uh, into the future. We know what is needed to be done to level up this uh, city region. You've given us further uh, inspiration uh, in this report. I, I, I say to the government now, it's time to work in partnership to help Greater Manchester and the country recover from this, uh, this pandemic. You have provided the blueprint. We accept it. Uh, we support it. Uh, and I know I speak for all colleagues in Greater Manchester and saying we are ready to, to deliver it given the necessary support. Thank you very much indeed. Andy, thank you so much. Um, we've now got a panel um, and I say to the panelists with great apology, we've only got a tiny amount and Andy and I have actually stick to time. So that's quite remarkable given the two individuals involved, Andy and me, that we've managed to stick to time. So the challenge to our panelists is to stick to time to follow Andy's lead. Um, if he can do it, you can. And so what we want to do is talk about three of the themes from the report and to get your reactions. And the first is build back fairer for future generations and the impact of the pandemic on young people. And so we want to know your perspective on how the pandemic has affected younger people and what action should be prioritised to build back fairer in Greater Manchester. Uh, Sandeep, I'm not going to spend long time interview, introducing everybody, but you're the executive lead for mental health. Uh, your perspective, please, your answer to that. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for inviting me. Really honoured to be here standing by our young people. Uh, and I'm here as a professional, as you say, but also a parent. And I think importantly for everyone, as a person who was born and raised in Greater Manchester, 
it's such a rich city because of its diversity, but also very complex because of that. So I think this report is brilliant in shining a light again and highlighting the health inequalities, which uh, are the complexities. And you've already um, referred to the negative impact uh, that uh, the COVID pandemic has had on the mental health and well-being of our children and young people. Um, these are the unintended consequences of the pandemic. And it's so crucial because young people make a about a third of our population, but they're all of our future. So I think this report helps us because in the Build Back Fairer framework, uh, children and young people in early years is one of the key uh, parts of the framework. But also, Michael, in your MARMA indicators, you've got mental well-being and early years education. So that is crucial, I think, in, in our toolkit moving forward. So I will say that and that's brilliant and it gives us a real opportunity. Um, what I do want to say, though, is uh, mental health and mental illness was rising pre-COVID. So that's important for everybody to remember and recognise that actually what we're doing now is uh, COVID has accelerated the challenges around mental health and well-being. But this report allows us um, an opportunity to, as a whole system, come together and importantly address that. What are we actually seeing and why? So back in 2015, um, Andy will remember it was one in 10, the figure quoted of our young people diagnosed with a mental, diagnosable mental health condition. That's three in every 30 in a classroom. It's now, uh, Michael, in October, one in six. That's four or five in every classroom. So that reflects what you've just shared. We need to be we need to get better. We have a strong foundation in Greater Manchester of whole system partnership working. But now this gives us an opportunity to build even stronger, to build back fairer and stronger. Why have the, why has this happened? We're seeing and we'll hear from our young people um, after me, more importantly, we're seeing um, higher, significantly uh, higher rates of self-harm, of anxiety, of depression, of post-traumatic stress and, and eating disorders, two to threefold increase. So that's really important that we need to be ready and resourced to meet that need. But we need to prevent. That's where we really need to focus. We know that 75% of adult mental illness begins before the age of 18. We know that we can prevent mental illness becoming long term and chronic by doing a lot of the things that have been outlined in this report. So that's really important. Lockdown has meant uh, school closures, social restrictions, peer group restrictions. Uh, for young people, employment disruption for young people, loss of structure, loss of routine, loss of that uh, regular uh, delivery of their education and a widening divide. So we need to recognise that. But what our young people are also telling us is please also listen to us that we want hope and positivity messages that actually as young people we have survived this and we've survived it by being more engaged in our communities, by peer support, by camaraderie, um, by working together. So that's a phenomenon called post-traumatic growth. So whilst we need to recognise the increase in mental health and mental illness neg negative impact, we must also use the assets in our community. So build on our community assets, uh, build our mentally healthy schools, our mentally healthy high streets, our mentally healthy communities. We've got huge assets. We've done some really good work in our school readiness programme, our mentally healthy schools programme across Greater Manchester, the Young Persons Guarantee and our dedicated university mental health service. But we can do better, Michael, by widening those partnerships, media, leisure and culture sectors, all of the social prescribing that we know is important in prevention. Uh, utilising our spaces and green spaces better and then digital, which is what I'll end, end with. The digital enablers that have actually helped us to um, still deliver services and reach our young people. We know that in Greater Manchester, we've done a snapshot evaluation. Over 50% of those accessing digital services have been young people. However, there is a however, our challenges. It's also shone a light on digital poverty but we can't address this alone. We have to address this as an ecosystem. And I think this report will be an important opportunity for us to do that. So what I will say is Greater Manchester is a place of many firsts. It's now the first Marmot City. This is a great opportunity for us as a whole system to come together and work together. But importantly, uh, part of that system has to be our young people. They have to co-develop and co-create and we need to listen to them. So let's make them visible with a voice, Michael.
Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say that's the most valuable three minutes I've heard in a long time, but it was actually five minutes. So um, you set a challenge for me, but it was wonderfully valuable. So let's hear from our young people. Um, we've got two. Are you going to manage it in three minutes or is it just Shakina? Um, um, yeah, it's just me. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, so from my perspective, uh, one thing I'll pick up on is anxiety. I feel like anxiety that has come from uncertainty in the environment because of COVID, like people, whether it's unsure of how you're going to manage in your household, work with income coming in, like parents losing work that like was mentioned before, or whether you're unsure of which university is going to take you in, or just that fear of being away from school because school has been such a like an important part in young people's lives and to have that disruption in school because of the pandemic has really taken a toll on young people's well-being so uh, I agree with I think it's Sandeep yeah and um, that there needs to be a collective response in terms of tackling these issues that have affected young people because we can't focus on one aspect and leave the others so i think with health and well-being it's really important to first listen to young people listen to what they have to say and not just assume from maybe like previous reports or studies but actually go into the communities where there's inequalities and inequalities is a big thing as well because the pandemic has really unfortunately uh, made a wider gap in inequalities and um, digital uh, poverty was spoken of um, inequalities in education people not being sure how to teach themselves or people not even sure of how to access the classroom environment from home i feel like it has really affected young people in so so many ways so in turn in order to overcome this there needs to be like i said before a collective response in terms of tackling this these effects that young people are facing and currently are facing right now so it, i don't know how that would work per se because there's so much to tackle but th having conversations like these are a start and it and um, sheds light on what needs to be tackled and i feel like the environment as well just the environment in which young people are brought up in and just being able to access help from many different resources is very very important so knowing the resources first so education whether that's going into schools giving talks assemblies to young people saying this is how you can get help if you're feeling this way or maybe through homes talking to people in the community community outreach in different i don't know with i don't know leaflets or having a team going out to help people basically doing practical things so it's not just like talking about it saying oh we're going to do this we're going to do that but actually putting it into the community i feel like is so important in order to like improve people's mental health i think it, yeah mental health has just been a key thing throughout this pandemic and that's the main thing that's been affected as well so if we can find a collective way to improve young people's mental health whether it's with the young people's guarantee because i know that is going to really help as well uh with our pass as well that really helps as well takes away the stress of trying to budget for bus passes and all that so yeah a collective response to help young people is what we need moving forward and yeah thank you well for those who might think that mental illness is an attribute of an individual or anxiety is somehow the fault of the individual and you need to pull your socks up i would like to replay what you just said for us now um, I've never heard it said more succinctly and more powerfully that young people are suffering because of the uncertainties in the environment, because of the social influences on their families and on themselves. Shakina, thank you for that. I don't know which university you're a professor at, but um, they're very lucky to have you. Um, so let's move on. Um, to uh, the, the question about uh, local power and control, resourcing it and commissioning. Um, I could introduce the first panelist, um, but that would be like introducing Raheem Sterling at Wembley to uh, introduce Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester. Um, but so I won't do that. But the, the question is, Andy, here you are as mayor of GM. We've talked about Build Back Fairer, 
yes, there's devolution. How do you get to the point of mobilizing the resources? How do you use your devolved powers in the context of the uh, resources you have to build back fairer? Ah, oh, it's such a good question. Mobilizing is the is the word, Michael. I mean, I meant what I said when I say I work in the best city region in the country because you've heard it. You've heard the voices on this call, haven't you? You can hear the passion <clears throat> in every one. Um, we are on a mission here, really, and it's my job to try and sort of be clear about that mission and that vision. But what what I'm trying to do is then. I mobilize people by kind of setting something that we all believe in and we all want to see and therefore you know you, you create that energy that goes around the system how do i use the power specifically it is about convening people i guess as, a, as, a, as an entire system we as a city region with health devolution are adopting a health in all policies approach and we do have a unique situation where we have uh, all public bodies in the room when we're discussing these things about giving kids the best start in life and improving school readiness or you know the life um, readiness of our teenagers as Shekinah so eloquently just spoke to it's it's a whole system mission Michael is what we're, we're doing here so it's not necessarily about the powers that I have because um, I often am trying to go be, be bigger than the individual powers that we have it's about a vision that people can buy into um, but also walking that vision with people, as she kind of said, there's a famous slogan in this city region of deeds, not words. You know, we're trying to do it as well and not just talk it, you know, and I think that is such an important point that, um, that she kind of made. And we're going to hear, I think, from Ian MacArthur from um, our, our growth company soon, who's, who's leading on the good employment charter for us. The thing is, Michael, I don't think we need, you, you can't be sort of held back because you don't have a specific power. So the good employment charter is a sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's a, an initiative that we've just done ourselves to try and improve the quality of our jobs, our work from the bottom up. The truth of the matter is, talking to what Sandeep said, the, the, the terrible insidious culture of casual work, of zero hours contracts. Zero hours contracts destroy people's mental health. That's what they do. And, and they destroy people's physical health because they can't, as I say, stop working even when they're ill. And we're just trying to rebuild things from the bottom up and doing it by just the classic Manchester way of doing it collectively. You know, the, the B is the symbol of this city for us for a good reason. And it says nobody in this city region is more important than anybody else. We're all a team and we're all pulling together. And I'm just maybe trying to steer the, the ship here and there. But I'm lucky to have a system that is buying into what you are saying, hopefully what, what I am saying. Uh, because we want better lives for our, for our residents and we're not accepting anymore the inequality that we see across England. This country is, is way too divided and the pandemic has, has shown that. And we are saying change has to come. Leveling up has to be real. And we have plans here for this city region as to how you make it real. Plans to improve our homes, to improve our jobs, to get a transport system that people can actually afford. That's what we're all we're all about, uh, uh, Michael. It's about being more than the sum of our parts, I guess, is how I mobilize people, you know, put big visions out there about what we can do for our young people. And then hopefully people are buying in more and more to what Greater Manchester is, is all about. But um, yeah, it's, it's we've got big challenges, but we've got absolute uh, big hopes and, and uh, amazing people who are, who, are, who are committed to the task. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to come to Sarah in a moment to talk about the Health and Care Partnership, but Joanne Roney, you're Chief Executive of Manchester City Council, so you embody the fact that this is not just about the health and care system. How do you deal with the question of devolution and control and mobilising resources? Um, so let me just use my three minutes wisely. Um, having followed Andy, I could just say I agree with everything Andy said. Um, and that's not just because he's the mayor, but I actually agree with everything Andy said, because um, everything Andy exemplifies as the mayor of GM is writ large through our DNA as a, D as a GM. 
and we all stand for those principles and we all stand behind Andy in terms of delivering on all of the agendas that he set out. I'm going to make four quick points for me um, because we haven't said it, so I'm going to say it. one of the bedrocks of levelling up for me and building back fairer does have to be a fair funding settlement for local government and our partners because we actually um, we can bring as much passion as you want to the table, but we need boots on the ground to connecting those communities to make a difference. And that's what we've shown through the pandemic. Um, I think that's particularly true of the outstanding public health teams uh, in GM. But of course, that also goes to the voluntary sector, our NHS colleagues uh, and our communities ourselves. Um, I'd like to see the Shared Prosperity Fund overtly being stated as addressing uh, tackling health inequalities. Actually, I think there's a real opportunity for the country to not just invest in infrastructure, but to invest in those wider um, social uh, economic factors uh, around infrastructure investment. And I think we're the place to do that. Um, it isn't just the passion of GM, it's the evidence base of GM. We did an independent economic prosperity um, and uh, productivity study that, that, put, that drew out the connection between poor health and productivity in GM. Um, we know that if the UK PLC is going to be successful, then it needs the North and it needs GM to be successful. And for us to be economically successful, we need to address the health inequality of our places. So for me, um, you ask about how I address this, it's making sure we pull together the economic rationale and the growth of the city with the uh, making those opportunities real for the people who live in this city. And we need to do more about that and your report reframes that for us, I think, um, and renews that passion. We have evidence about what we've done to improve early years. We have evidence about what we have done to close the gap through the devolved skills funding. I would say unashamedly, not just a funding settlement, but freedom and flexibility with the resources that we've got to use them in the way that better connects our communities to the challenges and the opportunities here. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes on vaccination rollout and just a little it's with six months of hard graft knocking on doors in communities to build trust to open up those doors and remove barriers so our people can access vaccines quickly and we've closed the gap on um, some of our communities now ac accessing vaccine that didn't happen without people coming together in neighbourhoods to really talk to communities, listen to communities and respond to what they were telling us. Um, that isn't just the response we need in a pandemic. That's how we should be delivering our services all of the time. Progressive universalism. My final point is um, hope. And um, whilst I uh, see the challenges ahead and your report clearly identifies what more we have to do in the way Andy said about galvanising the resources we've got, I actually think there is hope here. Um, and I think that hope for me comes from a need for us to build confidence based on the talent that exists in this place, based on the passion, the resilience, the confidence and the desire to do this in this in, in this city and this region. Um, I think the strengths we have means that we're going to do this. We're going to do it together and we're going to do it with our young people more than ever, ever before. And I think we are all reflecting not just on your report, Michael, but on what we know in our communities of the legacy of the pandemic and how we're going to do it and we're going to do it differently and we are going to build back fairer. Thank you Joanne, terrific. Um, Sarah, you're Sarah Price, your Chief Officer of Greater Manchester's Health and Social Care Partnership. What does this uh, devolution control of resources mean to you in building back fairer? So, I mean, of course, I could say I agree everything that Andy and Joanne have just said, but um, I think the important thing is the contribution that health and the NHS itself does play in this wider system. And I think that's the unique thing about Greater Manchester. I don't know anyone else, none of my other colleagues 
who've got the same opportunities to work together to be able to affect change. And, you know, we all know that uh, from, from your work that the impact that the NHS has on, on, on health outcomes in the longer term isn't, you know, it isn't about health services, is it? It's, it's about those wider determinants. So being able to contribute and be part of this system approach, I think, is absolutely vital. And some of the work we've already done really underlines that, you know, the, the devolution agreement in GM has allowed us to invest in um, early health for people who are at risk of losing their jobs or, or, or um, uh, just after they've um, lost their jobs, um, get helping them get back quickly into work, building on the fantastic work that's already do been done on, on, on employment in, in GM. Um, uh, Joanne's just talked about the vaccination programme. What we've learned about working with communities over the last 15, 16 months has really helped us to see how we could do things differently, how we can co-create with our communities, not just with young people, but, but very important that that is, but also with um, um, some of our ethnic minority communities, as working with uh, community groups, voluntary sector to be able to do that. And I suppose the other thing from a health point of view is that commitment to ongoing funding. We're very short term in our thinking about investment and if we're going to really make a difference. We have to rebalance that. So, of course, we have to deal with um, the, the, the impacts of the pandemic, the backlog of, um, of health, uh, that health care that needs to happen. But we also have to invest for the future, for our future generations, for our young people. So we need to be able to commit um, even if it's uh, money is tight, we need to be able to commit to that longer term and to really invest in prevention. Um, um, otherwise, we'll just be running around that hamster wheel and we'll never really escape from all of this. So, so, so seeing it as legitimate to in, invest in, in a much broader approach, I think, is something that GM's already started to do. We've got some fantastic examples of that, but we need to keep doing that going forward and using the power of our institutions to be able to pro provide jobs, create jobs, um, uh, improve the income of people will come on to that. So I'll leave that for others to comment on, but, but all very important if we're really going to build back fairer. Terrific. Uh, I just apologise profoundly that we've given such limited time to such brilliant people, but thank you for what you've been saying, all of you. Creating healthy places. Uh, and everything's taking place in the context of limited resources. Um, that's something we've all been saying. So how can GM build back fairer, creating healthier places in that context? Um, and Janelle de Grucci, um, who's uh, president of the Association of Directors of Public Health and Director of Public Health in within GM in Tameside. Can you respond to that challenge? Sorry, thanks. Yeah, so I think um, there's some real challenges that have been set out, but I think what you've heard from people in Greater Manchester here is around how they're, they're real opportunities for us. Um, and I, I think one of the, the big opportunities, I, I know Joanne set out about how people, how in Greater Manchester we previously pre-COVID looked at how you need a health, health and the economy to work closely together. You need people to be healthy, to be able um, to have a strong economy uh, and vice versa. I think with COVID, uh, people understand that much more. I think, Michael, that actually people understand what you're saying much more. They can see, as Andy set out, how those social factors about where you work, um, how you got to work, where you live, who you live with, all of that um, have impacted on, on the COVID. And equally, they actually impact on our health more broadly and on the inequalities. Those are the things that drive those inequalities. So I think what, what we've also learned through COVID is how we have to really seriously do this together. So it's been a, a huge um, a G, GM was strong working together before. But now I think we I mean, speaking as a director of public health, um, we, I think our, our role and our, um, as, as leading leading on 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 public health um, is stronger. It's uh, function is 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 better understood. I think we need to build on that. 
But I think it's it's just being part of a much bigger system focused on reducing those inequalities. So how we work with the voluntary sector, and we know we're going to hear from them, how we work, you know, work together with young people in our communities and actually the businesses. There's been so much more working together, I think, which is which which really provides us not it, you know it's it's actually to make that hope that Joanne spoke of really a meaningful make, make a difference and reduce those inequalities what I think we need now apart from the resources is the is that policy agenda for leveling up so we, we need both I think um, I think we, we need to look at look to that success what will that success actually be um, we have to keep COVID down. I am worried. We are worried about the endemic nature of COVID and um, it's, you know, Greater Manchester has experienced COVID, um, you know, much more acutely, I think, than other areas. Um, but I think um, apart from that, we, we, we know that we can really make a difference if we work well together. Joanne spoke about the vaccination programme, about tackling those inequalities. So we need to build on that and learn from those to really try and tackle with common purpose the other areas of any you know the, the inequality that your report has has really um, brought brought you know fully set out for us is a huge challenge. What will our success look like if we deliver that? What will hope bring um, with all the energy and effort that we put behind it? I think for me, it's that we actually will see our children and young people grow into being happy, secure, fulfilled adults. I want them to be happy now, but I think also over their life course that they will become um, happy adults living um, in Greater Manchester, engaged um, in strong communities with, with their own families. And fundamentally that that gap that you set out will show, demonstrate between Greater Manchester and the rest of the country, that that gap in life expectancy is narrowed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you mentioned the voluntary sector. So where does the voluntary sector fit into this? Uh, Liz, Liz Winsor Walsh, Chief Executive of Action Together. Um, well, in some ways, the role of the voluntary sector hasn't changed in the pandemic. Um, it's always been about prevention. It's always been about tackling inequalities. And it's had an ability to flex and to respond to what local people are saying to it. Um, and, you, you, you know, we all saw that in the early days of the pandemic and that humanitarian response that was so quick to be stepped up by our sector. Um, so I don't think it's changed in the pandemic, but I think perhaps the recognition and the strength it has has changed in the eyes of others. So we've certainly seen um, a new scale of partnerships with the voluntary sector. Um, we managed to get over some of the blockers and the barriers in the way that sometimes prevents our sector uh, from really reaching its potential. So that those blockers around commissioning and money, of course, that that are kind of critical if we're going to um, mainstream this way of working together. Um, but I think I, you know, I also reflect on Joanne's point earlier on some of the real successes and, and where can we learn through the examples of what Greater Manchester has done. And I think the Greater Manchester uh, response to vaccine hesitancy is a really good example of the role and the value of the voluntary community and social enterprise sectors. Um, and it really does demonstrate why we need to work in partnership um, alongside each other. Um, but it also sh shines a light on the value of the social infrastructure that is needed and needed to be built in our kind of local places. Um, you know, that social infrastructure has been with us for years and years and years. That The trust that has been called upon now in those partnerships has been created outside of the public sector systems for years and years and years and it's that trust that's been fostered between local people between local organizations in community action um, with um, local leaders uh, and voluntary organizations it's that trust um, that we need uh, to build on and i think what my plea, I suppose, from today is to really think about how do we mainstream that, value it in its own right, 
in a role to tackle inequalities, but also how do we support it um, and strengthen that social infrastructure that will be owned and shared and people have a stake in themselves uh, to be part of the ongoing solutions in Greater Manchester. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we at the Institute of Health Equity at UCL for the first time have been approached by uh, the business sector and we've just signed a partnership with Legal and General to work with them uh, and they want to bring other um, sections of industry into this partnership. So Ian MacArthur, um, Director, I, we heard from Andy briefly about the Good Employment Charter, uh, Director of the Growth Company. Can you talk about where the business sector fits into this? Thank you, Michael. It's um, a real pleasure to join everybody, but um, it's always the uh, the bad slot right at the end where everybody's yeah. covered the points. Um, but just to say, look, I think good employment uh, across all sectors has a role to play in how we build back fairer. Um, I think through the pandemic, um, the private sector has, uh, there's been winners and losers uh, throughout this. There's some sectors have done really well uh, and some haven't. Um, but I think a theme we touched on earlier was unpredictability and business likes predictability and with the unpredictability we've had over the last 18 months or so and the extended lockdowns it's been very difficult for the business base uh, and particularly those that Andy highlighted uh, in the service sector um, those that are or we used to call um, low paid low skilled workforce which transformed overnight into key workers uh, and then we realized the value of those key workers um, but they have suffered long long time with low pay insecure work and often young people uh, attracted into those roles initially so it, it almost the pandemic in the workplace setting has deepened many of the existing inequalities and we've seen this across many of the equality domains uh, not just in ethnicity, but gender um, and uh, disability, a whole range of uh, areas that uh, have come to light and been uh, deepened through the pandemic. However, I think just to, to give us a, a, an uplift, perhaps, I think what the uh, business sector and employers generally have also now realised is that the way perhaps they were working before made them fragile they've realized their vulnerability and on the flip side of that they've started to realize the reliance on each other and others in the system uh, business uh, in greater manchester has really appreciated the public sector effort to support business survival over the last 18 months and thinking about supply chains etc so picking back on the theme of greater manchester all in this together I think the business sector through the last 18 months has realised the, the sum of the parts of Greater Manchester that supports the economy. And I think perhaps more importantly to this discussion, uh, many, many employers have now realised the central importance of health, well-being and the voice of their employees. Um, they've had to listen to employees as they've been cast aside in different um, remote locations. They've had to understand the health and welfare issues that they're dealing with. And I think those un employers who have embraced that and who previously worked in that way have been more resilient and have been more successful through, through the pandemic than others. Um, those that thrive, invest in themselves, invest in their people, invest in their local communities will be the ones that will go more strongly uh, forward and particularly I think in terms of how young people will view them. Um, it's quite clear that there's a demand for a more ethical uh, base of business moving forward and I think we start with good employment standards on that journey. So I think um, with that sort of understanding and approach uh, and really hope that our business base can play its full part in creating uh, not just good employment, but building back fairer. Thank you, uh, brilliant. 
I've got minus one minute for my five minute summing up, so I'll be brief. Um, listening to this panel discussion, and I listened intently, and what occurred to me was several dichotomies. And usually when I pose a dichotomy for myself, the answer is not either or, it's both. Should we be depressed about what's going on in GM or should we be hopeful? Yeah, we should, both. We should be depressed at what's happened to GM through no fault of GM's own through what's been swirling around nationally over the last decade and longer. But we should be hopeful because of the people represented on this panel this afternoon. Um, what's important, the physical health or the mental health um, consequences of what's going on? Yeah, they're both important, absolutely vital. What we heard from Shekina and uh, from Sandy and others, and what we heard from Andy about job insecurity, that's a mental health phenomenon, but that will damage physical health. Uh, if you can't feed your children, that'll damage their physical health. But by golly, it's a mental health load on you if you haven't got the money to feed your children. Do we need action at local level? And I include region or central. Yes, that's what we heard very clearly. GM is empowered. Um, to take action, but can't do it without the resources. That came through very clearly. And I said at the beginning, um, I talked about moral and practical. Um, I've actually quoted Andy in the past, you know, I take a moral approach to health inequalities. It's a matter of social justice, but you've got to get the buses meeting people's needs. You can be as moral as you like, but if people can't travel from A to B because there's no bus or they can't afford it, or you want young people to be able to enjoy what Manchester has to offer, they've got to be able to travel around. So you can be as moral as you like, but then you've got to take real practical action. And so I love the transport example, because it's an example of something that's really, really, really tangible and makes a real difference to people's lives. So we do need those tangible practical actions. And what I said at the beginning, I mean strongly, Andy, when we started to work with you and your colleagues and we read the background papers from GM and I thought, we've got nothing to offer you. You're doing it all yourselves. This is fantastic stuff. This is really brilliant. Your vision for the future. So if we're able to bring the knowledge we have and work with you to help make that vision practical, the reason we're doing this is a matter of social justice to create better lives for the people of Greater Manchester and for the people of Britain as a whole. So working with you, and I hope we'll continue to work with you, has been an absolute privilege and I want to thank you for that and thank all of the colleagues who contributed this afternoon. Thank you.